1974, on the shores of Lake Tanganyika, there was a war. A war in the wilds of Gombe National Park. A war fought by chimpanzees. This war broke open the facade that chimpanzees were largely peaceful creatures, incapable of the levels of violence previously only seen observed by human beings. Observations of infanticide, cannibalism, and acts of brutality by the famous primatologist Jane Goodall only bolstered these claims and ushered in a new understanding of chimpanzee behavior and social dynamics. The war is thought to have largely been the result of a power struggle between rival males fighting for dominance over this group of chimpanzees. They are our closest relatives after all, and maybe we can learn a thing or two about ourselves by taking a look at the Gombe Chimpanzee War. This story begins in the Casaquila research area of Gombe National Park, where our group of chimpanzees made their home. Their territory was bordered on the north by the Mitumba community of chimpanzees and on the south by the Kalande community of chimpanzees. Each of these chimpanzee communities were territorial, and aggressive defensive displays were observed between them. The communities would send out patrols and occasionally raid into neighboring territories. Lone females and infant chimpanzees were subject to violence, but large-scale intergroup conflict was not observed. When patrols did come into contact with one another, displays were mostly just noisy and posturing, shows of force, just like, hey, this is our territory, get out type of stuff. That all changed for the Casaquila community, though, when its longtime alpha male died. Immediately, a dominant chimpanzee named Humphrey assumed command. Power abhors a vacuum, after all. But two brothers from the Casaquila community, Hugh and Charlie, did not take too kindly to Humphrey's ascension to power. At first, their dissension was pretty much non-violent. They and four other male followers, Godie, Dee, Goliath, and Sniff, absconded to the southern portion of the Casaquila Range, refusing to associate with the Humphrey-aligned faction of Mike, Satan, yes, Satan, Sherry, Everett, Fegan, Rodolph, and Jomeo. This led researchers, including Jane Goddall, to proclaim a northern subgroup and a southern subgroup for the Casaquila community. Eventually, though, these subgroups would split to become two full-on, newly distinct chimpanzee communities. The northern community were still referred to as the Casaquila, while the southern community became known as the Kahama community. After the split, interactions became increasingly hostile between the two groups, as the southern separatists made forays into the northern territory. Still, interactions were nonviolent, limited to more posturing and more noisy shows of force. The peace was not to last, however. The war began in January. By this time, Fegan had become the new alpha male of the Casaquila, and a party consisting of Fegan, Humphrey, Jomeo, Sherry, Everett, and Rodolph ambushed the lone Kahama male, Godi, as he was eating. Godi attempted to flee, but was captured and brutally beaten. The Casaquila party celebrated their triumph with boisterous displays and vocalizations carried out in the presence of the lifeless Godi. Godi would later die of his injuries, but the Casaquila continued with their ambush tactics. D was the next victim, followed by Goliath, an older male many of the Casaquila had been friendly with before the split. One researcher described this attack as particularly brutal, with the Casaquila party attempting to dismember Goliath by twisting his leg. Hugh disappeared shortly after, presumably also a victim of the Casaquila War Party. Charlie was next, his body having been found by researchers with more brutal injuries. At this point, only Sniff remained from the original Kahama males. He managed to survive for another year, but was eventually killed by the Casaquila as well. Jane Goodall later recalled that Satan had cupped his hand below the chin of Sniff to drink the blood from a wound on his face. 
of the female Kahama, one was killed, two went missing, and three others were beaten and kidnapped by the Kasekila. By 1978, the Kahama had been vanquished. But the cycle of violence continued. The Kasekila, emboldened by their successes, took over the old Kahama territory. Only now, this put them right up against the territory of the southern Kalande community, who outnumbered them. The Kasekila lost two males, Sherry and Humphrey, in this conflict and retreated back to the north only to find themselves now in conflict with the Matumba community, who also outnumbered them. Kasekila territory shrunk to less than two square miles, threatening the very viability of their community. Only the young males of the Kasekila, who together with the old guard put together some more impressive shows of force, more verbal posturing, but no violence, only they averted total disaster for the war-ravaged Kasekila. This conflict, regardless of whether or not you want to call it a war, was a very valuable time period for chimpanzee research. It showed that chimpanzees are not, in fact, gentle vegetarians incapable of violence. Indeed, they are capable of large-scale intergroup conflict. Conflict that proved surprisingly brutal, with the Kasekila frequently celebrating their victories over the lifeless bodies of their enemies. Jane Goodall, upon observing this, had nightmares about all she had seen. Prior to this, she had not witnessed the chimpanzee capacity for violence in this way. Initially, she was accused of anthropomorphizing the conflict too much, attributing human influences, human actions like a war to the natural world. But subsequent studies have confirmed that chimpanzees do indeed wage wars. Brutal wars. Wars brought about by power struggles and resource scarcity. Sound familiar? We might not like to admit it, but maybe we're not so different from chimpanzees as we think. Okay, uh, back into the world of international parks for this video, heading to Gombe National Park in Tanzania. Uh, I've gotten a few suggestions for more international coverage, like this one from Ecodex4431. I also want to give a shout out to another subscriber for suggesting this topic. Uh, it was in a private message, so I'll keep it private, but you know who you are. Thank you for the suggestion. Uh, there are so many good international stories that I would love to tell. Uh, sometimes they're a bit hard to do since I can't always like, travel there and I don't have access to as many resources for like research and footage as I do here, talking about national parks and public lands in the States. But as this community continues to grow, I hope to be able to change that type of thing and cover more international stories more. If you'd like to help me continue to bring these stories to more people and cover more international stuff, do be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the little bell to get notified for new episodes. That goes a long way to helping these stories reach more people. If you'd like to help out uh, in a more direct financial way, you can check out my Patreon. I have Discord, I do AMAs, director's commentaries, I run a book club that's really fun. Uh, you can get your name in the credits, some other miscellaneous things like that. Uh, that's starting for as low as like $2 per month. So you can check that out at patreon.com slash nationalparkdiaries. Make sure to follow me on Instagram for like channel updates, park visits. Uh, if you need to get in touch with me in any way, that's probably like the easiest place to do it. Um, other than that, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.